Greetings friends around the world, especially those of you who care about Christianity, especially those of you who care about the original Christianity, and those of you who indeed care about the Word of God and what in the Word is there for us and what is God's will for our lives. I've got one very simple question for you for this 2023, just before the so-called Valentine's Day hits the whole world. My question to all of you is, would Jesus Christ keep Valentine's Day? That's a question that all those who care about true Christianity and the Word of God should ask themselves. Uh, what is the 14th of January? Well, dear friends, in about two days, two days from where I'm recording this, it'll be 14th of February, and it'll, it'll be the Roman Catholic designated Valentine's Day. Now, while many people view this day as the chosen day to give a card and gift to their lover, this celebration is steeped in a history of paganism. So let's ask ourselves the question, would Jesus Christ keep Valentine's Day? Would Jesus say to you, oh yes, it's okay to keep Valentine's Day? Would he condone or condemn the keeping of this day? Let us firstly consider the camouflaged occult gods of Valentine's Day. The first one is Cupid, the son of Venus. He goes back in antiquity to Tammuz, son of Semiramis and Nimrod. The second camouflaged occult god of, uh, god of Valentine's Day is Jupiter, the head deity and sun god. It's anciently Nimrod, Semiramis' husband. And the third one is Venus, the daughter of Jupiter, and is really Semiramis herself, who was both mother and wife of Nimrod, and she was known as the Queen of Heaven. So those are the three occult deities being camouflaged by this so-called popular uh, Christian, so-called Christian holiday. Now, Nigel Pennick, author of the Pagan Book of Days, describes February, the month in which Valentine's Day is false. And here is the quote. The name of this month comes from the Roman goddess Februa and Saint Febronia from Febris, the fever of love. She is the patroness of the passion of love. Her orgiastic rites are celebrated on 14th of February, still observed as St. Valentine's Day, when, in Roman times, young men would draw billets naming their female partners. This is a time of clear vision into other worlds, expressed by festivals of purification. On the 1st of February is the celebration of the Cross Quarter Day, or Fire Festival, in bulk, a purificatory festival. It is followed on the 2nd by its Christian counterpart, Candlemas, the purification of the Virgin Mary. This was end of the quote. Quote from the Pagan Day Book of Days, penned by Nigel Pennick, page 37. This should already raise grave concerns for all of those who want to follow true and undiluted word of God. Now, during Lupercalia, the names of young women were put into a box and drawn out by men and as chance directed. Exchanging Valentine grew out of this name drawing. The Lupercalia was therefore a licentious time of fornication where young men would draw the, de the name of a young lady from a box and the two were considered a pair, sexually and otherwise, for the coming year. It has nothing to do with the genuine holidays of God, all listed faithfully in the book of Leviticus chapter 23 in your Bible. Any good encyclopedia or reference material will state where Valentine's Day originated, friends. The American Book of Days by Jane Murhatch, 3rd edition, reads, Association of Valentine's Day with lovers is a survival in Christianized form, mark this, in Christianized form of a practice that occurred on February 14th, the day before the ancient Roman feast of the Lupercalia, this was published in her book on page, aforementioned book on page 178. Then, Holidays and Anniversaries of the World by Lawrence Verdang and Christy Ann Donhoe in an article Valentine's Day says, quote, Valentine's Day is also believed to be a continuation of the Roman festival of Lupercalia, end of the quote. The new standard encyclopedia under the article Valentine states, St. Valentine was an obscure, possibly legendary martyr who by tradition was put to death by the Romans on February 14th, about 269 AD. This day was made a feast day by Pope Gelasius I of the Roman Catholic Church. The date of his death almost coincided with that of the Roman feast of the Lupercalia. The celebration of the two occasions were merged, end of the quote. 
Pope Galatius I, who included Valentine, admitted that he was among all those whose names are justly reverenced among men, but whose acts are known only to God. <laughs> well, as Pope Galatius I implies, nothing was then known about Valentine's life. So, all of the legends surrounding Saint Valentine are at best fictional and without any substance. Should this be enough arguments, friends, for you to understand what kind of stupidity paganism and unfounded, unfounded is this coming pagan holiday? Should it be enough? What else? Do you need some more? Well, Lupercalia, also known as Febratio, which is where we get the name for our month of February, was popular among many of the new converts of the quick-rising Catholic Church and as celebrations. The complete book of American holidays note on pages 52 and 51. And by the way, the complete book of American holidays was written by Robert G. Mayers and the editors of Hallmark Cards, published in 1972, pages 50 and 51. Everywhere that Roman Catholic Christians came into power, they immediately adapted the holidays and customs of the people to their creed. So Valentine's Day is nothing more than a continuation of the ancient pagan raunchy festival of Lupercalia. There is nothing mysterious or secret about this pagan observance, as most of these reference works also have information about Lupercalia. The Encyclopedia Americana in 1996 from the article Lupercalia says, An ancient Roman rite held each February 15th for the fertility god Lupercus. Goats and a dog were sacrificed and goat's blood was smeared on the foreheads of two young men and wiped off with wool dipped in milk. Young men wearing only goat skin around about their loins ran around the base of the Palatine Hill. It's a hill in Rome, by the way. Palatine Hill, so as you see, it's a Roman festival. It's a Roman rite. Roman rite has nothing to do with the rest of the world, nothing to do with original Christianity. So they were running around the base of the Palatine Hill, striking with goatskin stripes any whim, women they met. This was to ease labor for pregnant women and to make the others fertile. It's right for fertility, friends. has nothing to do with love, any love. The American Heritage Dictionary under Lupercalia reads, A fertility festival in ancient Rome, celebrated February 15th in honor of the pastoral god Lupercus. End of the quote. Even the month of February gets its name from this pagan, this pagan ceremony. The Latin febru februare means to purify after this so-called feast of purification. Some sources say that the thongs from the skins of sacrifi sacrificed animals, which the priests used on the evening of February 14th to whip women, were called februa. So in ancient Rome, this mid-February pagan feast day known as Lupercalia, the feast of Lupercus, was an ode to the god of fertility and a celebration of sensual pleasure. Who in mythology was Lupercus, you may wonder? Who was he? Well, Lupercus was believed by pagans, mark again, by pagans, not by Christians, friends. It was believed by pagans to be a hunter of wolves, like because Latin word lupus is wolf, associated with the Roman god Faunus, god of agriculture and fertility. Since Rome took its gods from those it conquered, we can trace Faunus to its Greek equivalent Pan, god of woods, fields and flocks. The ancients pictured both of these mythological beings as having a human torso, but legs, horns and ears of goats. This fits with the fact that they sacrifice goats and use thongs from their skin to whip women during this so-called feast. Pan, god Pan, Greek god Pan, can be traced to the Phoenician sun god Baal, also a god of fertility and nature. The pagan worship of Baal historically goes all the way back to Nimrod. Nimrod, who was the originator of all paganism in the ancient Babylon. He and his wife Semiramis. Dear friends, that's exactly what is truth about this Valentine's Day. In Genesis chapter 10 verse 9, Moses describes Nimrod as a mighty hunter. In the days after the flood, animals multiplied rapidly and caused fear among the people. Nimrod grew powerful because of his ability to fight the wild animals. 
What equipment does Cupid always carry? He is always pictured with a bow and arrows such as a hunter would have. In mythology, Cupid, also known as Nin or Ninus, meaning the sun, was the son of Venus. Ninus, indeed, was none else but Nimrod. Venus is the Roman equivalent of the Greek goddess Aphrodite and the mother goddess Semiramis, the biblical Ashtoreth. She is, so she is always pictured in the Bible. You, you can always see how the ancient Israel, how the ancient house of Israel and the ancient house of Judah would always slip to the worship of Ashtoreth and the worship of Baal. These pagan goddesses, dear friends, usually depicted with multiple breasts or breasts extremely out of proportion to their body, symbolized what else but fertility. The thread between Lupercus, Faunus, Pan, Baal, Nimrod, Cupid and Venus, Aphrodite, Ceres, Semiramis, Ashtoreth is fertility or in today's plain language, fornicatory sex. The celebration of the Lupercalia was just an excuse to lower the morals and inhibitions of people under the guise of religion. You may also wonder why 14th February? Well, the change from the 15th February to the 14th February came when Pope Gelasius simply ordered it changed in AD 496. Friends, this has nothing to do, 496 is 5th century, it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ or the Apostles, it's 5 centuries after them. As mentioned already, Catholic legend speaks of an obscure martyr named Valentine who was put to death on February 14th, AD 269, and the Roman Catholic Church made this day a feast day. There is nothing festive about a martyr's death. Why should any, why should there be any festivity about martyr's death? Of course. But that shows to you the nature of this of this celebration has nothing to do with love, has nothing to do with genuine pure love, has nothing to do with Christian customs. So it was that the Roman Catholic Church syncretized the pagan custom of the Lupercalia into Valentine's Day. Christians, this is very serious. Wake up! Now why did the Romans observe the Lupercalia on the 5th of February in the first place? Well, Nimrod was supposedly born at the winter solstice. In the 21st century before Christ, the solstice occurred on 6th January. As time progressed, however, this date moved earlier every 400 years or so. In Roman times, Julius Caesar ordered it fixed on 25th December. Today, it falls on 21st December. In antiquity, the mother of a male child customarily presented herself before her god for purification on the 40th day after giving birth. Now remember, the Lupercalia was a feast of purification. 40 days from 6th January is 15th February. Now despite its obvious pagan roots, is it still alright to keep Valentine's Day, you may wonder? Well, I guess the answer is obvious, but... Friendship and sending cards are wonderful things, no wonder indeed, and God is not opposed to romance at the right time and in the right way. But does this mean that you can and must only do this on Valentine's Day? Of course not. God is against two-faced double standards. If someone is special to you, then genuinely do those personal things regarding cards, flowers or gifts throughout the year rather than waiting until 14th February. The pagan religious history of Valentine's Day taints this as being unchristian without God's blessing. And friends, if that thing is without God's blessing, then it cannot bring any goodness or blessing. If it doesn't have blessing, it's void of blessing. It brings only curse upon people. Think about it. Lupercalia was an immoral fertility festival, also featuring gluttony and drunkenness. At the end of the festivities, young men would draw the name of a young lady from a box and the two were considered a pair, sexually or otherwise, for the coming year. Jesus would certainly not keep Valentine's Day, nor would he recommend that anyone else should keep it. Let's hear what he declared in the word as the word of God, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29. Deuteronomy 12, verse 29. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to possess, which you go to dispossess, that is, and you displace them and dwell in their land, 
take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe. Have you heard this, Christians? Whatever I command you, be careful to observe. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. Valentine's Day is not commanded by God. It was added, as you see, to our civilization by the Catholic Church and Pope Galatius I and Julius Caesar. Friends, when we merge pagan teachings with what God instructs through the Bible, we weaken the truth and violate God's clear command. That is a double standard. And once we violate God's clear command, then we put something else above God and before God, which is the violation of the first commandment. It cannot bring anything else but only the curse. The prophet Jeremiah was inspired by God to warn against following heathen, based customs of this world. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. Also, friends, putting a new face on an old ungodly observance, as sadly has been done massively by the modern nominal Christianity, so putting a new face on an old ungodly observance is wrong as the original evil. The prophet Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 writes, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Christ commands us in John chapter 4 verse 23 and 24 to worship God in spirit and in truth in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit, you'll have to have the spirit of God by repenting and turning away from these godless pagan customs and by embracing God, by repenting and then having biblical, true biblical baptism by which by which you enter into the, into the covenant with God and commit yourself to follow Him for the rest of your lives. And then of course, you will be able to then to indeed worship God in spirit and of course to worship Him in truth without having following customs which diluted the word of God and deceived the rest, the whole of humankind. Friends, God's way is true love of unconditional outgoing concern for the welfare of others, not our own selfish lusts and desires. Why does God not want us to look at other nations and other ways of worship and adopt those for our own worship of Him? Because we are, as it says in the, in the New Testament, ambassadors of the kingdom of God and we would be living a lie contrary to the truth of God. The second question you may ask is why do you think we should be careful of our, in our worship of God? Because it is God, friends, who has determined God's way of life that we should live and not the ways of Satan and his world. And if you want to follow Satan and his world that cannot bring any blessings to you or your children, it can only bring curse, dissipation and death. Thirdly, what did Christ say about God's true values we should follow? The Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. He answered and said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That was Mark chapter 7, verse 6 and 7. Friends, if you are true Christians, Jesus is our example, so we should follow Jesus Christ's conduct, just like the Apostle Paul was doing and he left us a record in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 be you followers of me Paul even as I also am of Christ so let me ask you a question considering that Jesus Christ would not keep Valentine's Day will you be keeping it keep in mind John 4 verse 23 and 24 worship God in spirit and in truth Worship God in spirit and in truth and remain faithful and resist Satan and this world lest you bring curses upon yourself and your household. Thank you for your attention. Until next time, goodbye friends.